Well, good afternoon and thanks for joining our webinar. I'm Jessica Groskopf, Extension Educator with the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Today is a part of the Center for Agricultural Profitability's weekly webinar series, which usually happens every Wednesday, excuse me, every Thursday at noon central. A full schedule is available on our website at cap.unl.edu. Today's webinar is brought to you by Nebraska Extension's Land Link Program, which works to connect land seekers and land owners who are retiring and looking to find successors. Land seeker and land owner applicants are matched with the most compatible counterparts so that a mutually beneficial partnership can be forged over the course of a transition plan. For more information about the program, visit cap.unl.edu slash landlink. How healthy is your business? What are its financial vital signs? What are banks looking for when they loan you money for your operation? Today, we're going to be taking a look at farm and ranch balance sheets and how to set, up your, set them up to answer your questions and more. As you have questions, we invite you to type them, type them in the chat or the Q&A um, in your Zoom uh, window at the bottom of your screen. I will work to answer each of them at the end of today's session. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share screens, get everything set up here. So when we think about uh, balance sheets and um, looking at the financial health of our business, we're gonna start by looking at the balance sheet. So a balance sheet is the uh, snapshot of your business's financial position at a point in time. So when I think about a snapshot or a picture, um, basically what it says is we're gonna look over everything all at once. And I have a colleague who says, it's like taking a drone and flying it over your business. Uh, what all does your business own and what all does it owe to somebody else? So balance sheets are required when applying for a loan and it can help guide the decision-making process. So I like to think of balance sheets as the school pictures that we used to take. And if your mom is like my mom, she used to line our pictures up side by side so that you could see how someone changed over time. And that's essentially what a balance sheet does is it allows us to look at your business at a point in time. And then hopefully we can line them up over the years and be able to see changes. Now, if you're like me, when I was a kid, there were some years that I got more attractive and there were some years that I got more awkward, right? And so we know that there are phases in our, in our businesses where we have to make some adjustments, right? So um, if we're looking at pictures, you know, one year you got braces, right? So that two or three years down the road, um, we had straight teeth. Um, and so those kinds of things are really what your banker is looking at is, how is this business progressing? And if we have an off year or a more awkward year, what happened in that year? And um, was it a correction um, and something that we, we know will get better or is it something that we need to make an adjustment for? So as we think about those balance sheets, I really wanna continue this picture analogy. Um, the other thing we can tell from pictures are some indications of health, okay? So when I look at a picture of somebody, you know, are their eyes clear? Is their skin clear? Do they seem happy in the photograph? Now, it's not a full, right, medical diagnostic um, opportunity, right? I can't tell the absolute health of somebody by looking at a picture, but I get, can get some pretty good indications. And I feel like that's similar uh, with a balance sheet. I can look at those indicators, and then if I need to dig deeper, I can dig into a business's other financial documents to find out more about what's going on. So again, it's kind of that initial uh, assessment of how is this person or how is this business doing? One of the really important steps that we need to take with a balance sheet is we need to do it on the same day every year. And I would really encourage you um, most of the time we're going to do that on January 1st. The reason I like a January 1st balance sheet is so that I have the ability to, to compare it to my other financial documents. Um, but if it's not a January 1 balance sheet, 
I want to do it at the same time every year so I'm at the same point in the production cycle. So for uh, us on, on our operation, January 1, probably have some uh, grain in the bin, maybe some prepaid supplies, um, but I don't have much investment in growing crops at that time. So it's a lot easier to uh, update that balance sheet when I'm going from the same time. If I look at two different balance sheets from kind of an odd interval date, it's harder to compare them side by side. Again, going back to that picture analogy, if I see a, a picture of a kid in the fall versus in the spring, you know, that, that difference in the growth um, can make it difficult to compare. So um, again, I, I really encourage that January 1st timeframe. And if it's not January 1st, just to be consistent with what time you're doing that balance sheet at you're likely going to do your balance sheet during that loan renewal period um, and your banker might direct what date they want that balance sheet done on. So how do I make this picture? So if you have a piece of paper, um, what you can do is just uh, throw a line down the middle of it. And we're going to be listing things on both sides of that line. So the first thing we're gonna list out are the assets and assets are everything that the business owns. And we're just gonna take that and it's always gonna be on the left-hand side of the balance sheet, okay? So what does your business own? Machinery, equipment, land, buildings, livestock, that's all gonna go down the left-hand side of that balance sheet. Now, as we're thinking about balance sheets, I think it's important um, and you're gonna need to have this conversation with your lender um, I like to see balance sheets that separate your business from your personal. So um, I'm going to show you a list of assets here in just a minute. Um, but I really want to know what's happening in the business, not necessarily what's happening in your own personal um, ownership. So it's important, at least from my perspective, that we keep that, that business and that personal separate. So when we're looking at that balance sheet or that picture, we're just looking at the farm or the ranch as its own business. So here are the list of things that should be included on that left-hand side of the balance sheet for assets. That includes cash, any checkings or savings accounts, prepaid expenses and supplies that are on hand, Anything that you've already invested in that growing crop, any accounts receivable, so if somebody owes you money, it should be there, um, hedging accounts, crops in the bin and market livestock, uh, breeding livestock, machinery, vehicles, land, building, and improvements. So that's the list of assets that we have on that left-hand side of the sheet. So the next thing that we're going to do on the left-hand side of the sheet is we're gonna assign a value to those assets. So at the, at the top of that list, if you list it out the, the way I just had it on the previous slide, some of that's pretty easy to come by, right? I know that I have this much cash on hand. I know that the bank balance is this much. Um, but when we get farther down and we start saying, well, what is that tractor really worth? Um, you might actually have two different values on it. So the first value is the cost value. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that, but how much did you pay for that item? And the second one is the market value. And the market value is if you sold that item today, what would it bring you? How much could you actually receive for selling that asset, whether it's a tractor or an acre of land or, uh, you know, cows, what are they really worth if I sold it today? So I want to talk a little bit more in depth on valuing these assets because I think it can be very challenging to say, well, today it's worth this, but tomorrow it's worth that. So let's start with talking about cost value. And cost value says, this is what I purchased it for, but there's this uh, idea of depreciation. So 
we want to, on the cost value, we want to say, what's the purchase price less the economic depreciation for our depreciable assets? So without going too far down a rabbit hole, we need to talk about what depreciation is. And basically, depreciation is the wear and tear um, on those assets over time that, de that depletes the value of the asset. And not every asset is depreciable, but many are. Uh, machinery, vehicles, uh, buildings, and breeding livestock are common examples of depreciable farm and ranch assets. You'll notice that land is usually not a depreciable asset. Over time, we expect land to increase or appreciate in value, where over time we expect those assets that are listed on the screen there to depreciate or decline in value. So depreciation that's reported on a balance sheet, um, sometimes we'll hear it called book depreciation, and it may be different than the, the depreciation that is reported to the IRS on taxes. So I wanna be very clear that there could be a difference in the depreciation that you're deducting on your balance sheet versus what you're reporting to the IRS through 179 deductions. So the traditional way to um, calculate or estimate depreciation um, for simplicity's sake of today is straight line depreciation. So what you're gonna do is say, I purchased that asset for this amount, I'm gonna determine how long or, or estimate how long I'm gonna have that asset. That's called its asset life. And at the end of that asset's life, I'm gonna estimate what it will be worth. So my example down at the bottom of the screen says, I purchased uh, say a piece of equipment for $75,000. I expect to hold that piece of equipment for 10 years. And at the end of that 10 years, it's gonna be worth $15,000. So um, 75 minus 15 is $60,000 is how much depreciation I'm going to take. And every year I'm gonna take an equal amount of depreciation. So that's $6,000 per year. Um, there are other ways to depreciate assets, um, but that's beyond the scope of today's discussion. Um, but I do wanna point out that if we're talking about valuing assets, especially depreciable assets, uh, we need to think about how much depreciation we're deducting and how we're changing that. And we need to be consistent on that cost value um, and our depreciation practices on those balance sheets. So the, the next one I think is a little bit easier for us to wrap our brains around, and that's the market value. And actually the bulk of balance sheets that we look at will have the market value on them. Um, but again, I would encourage you to have both. So the market value says, what is a, a willing buyer, uh, would, what would a willing buyer pay for the asset? Okay. So again, we know that market values fluctuate. Um, so this, this creates an interesting challenge uh, when we're looking at balance sheets because the value might change every day. So it's really interesting when we look at the market value of if I sold it today, what would it be worth? So this is what um, it would look like on your balance sheet. Um, and here's a perfect example of when there's a difference between the cost value and the market value. So on the screen, we have farmland. And farmland, um, you know, we, we hear the stories of, well, you know, dad bought that for $1,000 an acre or whatever it was, and now it's worth three times that or five times that. So this is a perfect example of why it can be interesting to show cost value and market value side by side. So on farm one, um, they bought it for about $150,000, give or take, and today it's worth around $300,000. So just showing those differences in the money actually put out um, for the asset versus what it could sell for. One of the challenges with valuing assets and market values is in reality, that market value depends on if there's a willing buyer who's willing to purchase that asset. 
And so I would encourage you as you're looking at your balance sheet and you're saying, what's the market value um, that you're conservative um, or cautious about what you actually value that at. Um, I also don't like to see folks change that market value every year. Um, as we get deeper into our discussion today, we're gonna be uh, looking at some uh, vital signs for a lack of a better term for our farm business. And those vital signs can be influenced if we change that market value every year. So I wanna know more about the actual changes in the business rather than just changes in market value. So sometimes folks will use, uh, they will change market value as a filter on their photograph. And so um, I like that uh, you, should, you should update that market value, you should have a realistic market value, but I would encourage you, unless you're going through a big change or it's been five or more years since you've updated them, that you leave them consistent. So I like to see if you're gonna use a market value, again, that we're conservative or cautious in what we set that value at. We don't set it too high. That creates the filter. Um, and that we don't change it every year, that we adjust it either when we're getting ready to make um, a purchase or a loan, or we need to make some adjustments to that balance sheet. When we're looking at um, asset values, I'm gonna go back one. Um, one way to get a true market value uh, would be to get an appraisal. So if you're not really sure, you know, what's this item worth? Um, if you're working with a bank, they might be able to send an appraiser out for you to help you determine what that market value will be. You never know um, what the actual market value is um, of that item until it's actually sold. So again, um, take care when you're valuing assets on your balance sheet. Um, I also like to make notes on that balance sheet and say, you know, this is the year that we adjusted um, that machinery value or that land value. So it can be really important, um, you know, to think about how it's structured, how we're valuing it and being consistent when we do so. All right, so we've got the left-hand side of our sheet. Uh, put together, now we've got to work on the right-hand side. And on the right-hand side of the sheet, we're going to list our liabilities or our debt, okay? So on the right-hand side, our liabilities are everything that the business owes to somebody else. Um, traditionally, that's a bank, but more and more we're seeing, you know, seed uh, dealers, uh, suppliers that have credit accounts associated with them. So Anything you owe to either another business, um, that needs to be listed on that liability side of the sheet. So what goes on the liability side of the sheet? That's accrued interest, accounts payable, operating loans or lines of credit, credit cards, machinery loans, land loans. Um, again, any debt that the business owes to someone else needs to be listed then on the right-hand side of that sheet. The liabilities is, is a lot easier um, to value, right? Because it's a solid number. I owe $1,000 to Joe, okay? So um, on the liability side, there's no challenges with valuation. You are gonna need to know um, specifics about um, that, that debt. In particular, you're gonna need to know how much of that debt is due this year or how much of that payment is due this year. So that is one of the challenges is saying, yes, I have a land loan. It's a, it's a big land loan, but part of that I'm going to pay in the coming year. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. So we essentially have a balance sheet. Okay, Doesn't look like one quite yet, but we have the good, a good start on a balance sheet. And this, if you're going in, um, to get your first time loan for your farm or your ranch, um, your banker's gonna ask for this. So you can do this ahead of time and just list out um, those assets and liabilities. Again, what your business owns and what it owes on that sheet. 
If you'd like to get fancy, we can organize this information. And we're gonna organize it. Um, we're gonna start with the asset side again. And we're gonna uh, organize it by the life of that asset. So for example, assets at the top are gonna have a life of less than a year. And we call those current assets. Intermediate assets have a life of one year to 10 years. And then long-term assets are gonna have a life of greater than 10 years. So um, as we go down, we're gonna organize it in this fashion and we call it uh, this type of organization by liquidity. So the assets I expect uh, to turn into cash or that our cash are gonna go at the top and then their lifespan will go down. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna um, match up the liabilities to the asset side. So for example, if I have a machinery loan that has a life of one to 10 years left on it, it's gonna be in that intermediate category. For each of these categories, I'm gonna subtotal, right? So I'm gonna to have total current assets, and then I'm gonna have total current liabilities, total intermediate assets, total intermediate liabilities, finally total long-term assets, final, uh, and total long-term liabilities. And at the very bottom, I'm gonna have total assets and total liabilities. Occasionally, I will run into a balance sheet that does not separate intermediate and long-term assets. They will simply have a current and a non-current component to them. So um, it's neither right nor wrong. Just don't be surprised if you see um, a balance sheet that rather than using current, intermediate, and long-term, simply uses current and non-current. It's not as common, um, but they do exist. So what assets go in which categories? So at the very top of our balance sheet, again, we're gonna have cash, uh, checking accounts, prepaid expenses and supplies on hand, invested investments in growing crops, accounts receivable, any hedging accounts and crops in the bin and market livestock that we expect to sell in less than a year. So that goes in the very top of that balance sheet on the left-hand side. In the intermediate category, we have breeding livestock, machinery, titled vehicles. And at the bottom of the balance sheet, we're gonna have land, building, and improvements. On the liability side, any accrued interest, accounts payable, operating loans or line of credit, credit cards. And the challenge on the liability side is bringing up the current portion of intermediate and long-term loans, which I talked about before. So the payment that's due within the next year needs to move to the top of that liability section. In the intermediate category, we have uh, machinery loans, uh, potentially also title vehicle loans. And then on the long-term side, we have those mortgages or land loans. So now that we have everything, um, assets and liabilities and organized by liquidity, the last thing that we need to do is actually make the balance sheet balance. And so you'll notice at the very bottom of the sheet, my assets will equal my liabilities plus my net worth. Well, what the heck is that? So net worth is the difference between the assets and the liabilities. And you might also hear it called owner's equity. And basically it's the value of what the owner has within the business, okay? So my assets will always equal my liabilities plus my net worth. And this calculation, um, if it's positive, it's good, okay? Um, it's, it's really one of those things where um, it doesn't tell me a lot about the business, um, but it does tell me a little bit about it. So uh, we just wanna make sure that we have that calculated at the bottom of our balance sheet. So it's a true balance sheet that balances assets equal liabilities plus net worth. Okay, so with that, we have created our complete picture, right? That shows our banker kind of who we are. So I'm gonna pause here for just a second. Um, I'm gonna check the chat box. If you have any questions, if you wanna put those in the chat.
Okay. I'm not seeing any questions come in. So I'm going to go ahead and keep going. So now that we have our balance sheet put together, we've created that picture. You're able then to approach the banker and the banker is going to look at that complete picture. And again, they're looking for that, those indications of health. So the health check part of today goes into, well, what is the standard, right? So there's actually the Farm Financial Standards Council, and it provides standard financial guidelines for farms and ranches. And this organization came um, out of the farm crisis of the 1980s. And basically what it does is it allows for comparison across businesses. So when your banker is looking at your balance sheet or your snapshot in time, they're able to say, how do they compare to everybody else within my portfolio? It also allows you as a farm business to say, well, how do I compare to other farmers? It helps us monitor financial health. Um, again, um, you know, that's one of those things that, that we have to, um, to watch is, is my business getting better or are we weakening? And how do I know what's right? And then we can also measure financial performance. So the Farm Financial Standards Council actually provides um, 21 different measurements right now of uh, farm financial health. Today on the balance sheet, I'm going to be looking at three specific ratios. And these three ratios um, help us look at that balance sheet and analyze that balance sheet. Um, but they're not the end all be all, right? Again, they're not that complete, you know, doctor's visit that tells us the health and well being of the business. It's those initial indications of health. So, when the Farm Financial Standards Council um, uh, creates measurements, they have three categories of measurements. The first one is liquidity, and that's the ability of the business to meet uh, the financial obligations as they come due. They have solvency, which is the, the ability of the business to pay all of its debts as if it were sold tomorrow. And the final one is profitability, which is the difference in the value of goods produced and their cost of production. So as we look at this, um, you'll notice that when we look at the balance sheet and the three ratios that I pulled out, we're not talking about profitability. We're going to use different uh, measurements and different financial documents to really dig into profitability. What we're really going to be looking at is working capital, the current ratio, and the debt to asset ratio. And these are measurements of liquidity and solvency. And what I like to say is, as I'm looking at a business, you know, if, if we're okay in these ratios, we're probably okay in the profitability range. If we're challenged in these ratios, we might need to revisit that profitability. So again, it's that initial analysis that says, do we need to dig deeper? I encourage all farms and ranches to dig deeper and get to those profitability measurements, um, but your banker is going to be watching these particular ratios on a fairly consistent basis. So we're gonna hop into each of these ratios and um, we'll get into how to calculate each of these ratios. Um, I see a couple of questions coming in through the chat. Um, one I'm gonna answer um, towards the end and the other one is can uh, we get a print off of these uh, slides after the session? And yes, you will get um, access to the slides after today's webinar. All right, so let's hop into each one of these ratios. And the first ratio is the working capital ratio. So working capital is the ability of the business to meet the short-term obligations. In other words, do I have enough cash or items that will become cash in the, within the year to pay off all the debt that I have promised to pay this year? Okay. And it, it's expressed in terms of dollars. So current assets minus current liabilities. So after I pay off all my debts, how much cash should I have left over at the end of the year? That's what working capital looks at. So we're looking at the very top of the balance sheet 
And again, it's a liquidity measure. So that's where we're at. Can the business cash flow in the near term? Yes or no. Um, for this indication, positive is good, negative is bad, right? Positive is good, negative is bad. One of the challenges with this one though is how much is enough? How much is enough? So the next ratio fits in um, and answers the how much is enough question. So the current ratio is using the same numbers as the working capital calculation. And what it says is, again, the ability of the business to meet the short-term obligations, but this time we're going to express it as a per percentage. So we're going to divide the current assets by the current liabilities, and we're gonna get a number. The way I like to read this number is, if I'm looking at, at your balance sheet for your business, you have $1.50 of assets to cover each dollar of liabilities. The Farm Financial Standards Council um, provides guidelines on we're good, we're okay, and it needs work. So if you have a ratio, a current ratio of 1.7 or better, you're good. If you have a current ratio between 1.1 and 1.7, we need to watch that ratio, we're okay, but we need to dig in and say, what's going on? And if that ratio is less than 1.1, right? So if I only have a dollar of assets to a dollar of liabilities, we're really being challenged in that area. And we need to make some adjustments to say, how can we do better? Because at this point, I'm not liquid. I cannot pay all the bills that I promised to pay this year. So um, those ratios there are what your banker is gonna, gonna look at. The um, third ratio that we're going to look at is the solvency measure. And this time we're gonna go down to the bottom of the balance sheet and we're gonna say, can the business, if it was all sold today, can it pay off all the debts that it has currently on the liability side of the balance sheet. Another way to think of it about this is how much of the business does a bank or um, uh, how much of the business does the bank own or somebody who's loaning us money, okay? So this time we're gonna divide total liabilities by total assets, okay? Because we put the liabilities on top, we want this number to be smaller. So the Farm Financial Standards Council says, if this number is less than 20%, you're good. If this number is between 20 and 60%, you're okay. And if this number is greater than 60%, we might need to think about something different for your operation um, and figure out why we have a higher debt load. Okay. So this is really, kind of the, the position that we sit in. You're gonna look at the current ratio um, and the debt to asset ratio um, and see how your business looks in terms of debt load. Again, it's not a measure of profitability. We're only looking at liquidity and solvency, um, but it is a good indication of how are you going to do this year and how is your business doing overall? So I'm gonna show you an example balance sheet um, and kind of work through how I think about um, balance sheets and, and show you how they might change a little bit. So here's a really simplified balance sheet. Um, and I actually like to do this with balance sheets. If we're trying to make a big decision, maybe we wanna purchase equipment or we have some extra money, where do I put it in my balance sheet that's best for the balance sheet? Um, and, and how does that affect my balance sheet? So here we have a, an example farm and it has uh, total assets of, of uh, $5 million. It's got current assets of 100,000, intermediate assets of 900,000 and long-term assets of 4 million. On the liability side, $90,000 in current uh, 410 in intermediate assets and $2 million in long-term debt, okay? 
So working capital, I'm going to actually uh, let's see if I can pull up my pull up my uh, calculator. Um, can you see that calculator on there, Ryan? Yep, looks good. Okay, so I'm going to kind of stick it in the middle of the screen and uh, sorry, it's not prettier. So um, again, to, to calculate that working capital, we're going to subtract from the current assets, the current liabilities. So that gives us the $10,000 uh, working capital number there. My current ratio, instead of subtracting them from each other, we're going to divide them. So 100,000 divided by the 90,000. That gives me the 1.11. Okay, it's tricky because total assets is down here, the very last line on the bottom left, but total liabilities is up here, okay? So remember, we put liabilities on top when we're doing our debt to asset. So the total liabilities for this operation is two and a half million divided by the 5 million, okay? And that gives you your 50% debt to asset ratio. So again, um, that's how we calculate each of those and, and that's what we did with them. Let me get my other stuff back up here. So um, just as an example to work through it, if I had, let's just say $10,000, what happens when I put it in different parts of the balance sheet? And how does that affect things? Okay. So I'm gonna put it in three different areas. I'm gonna put it in current assets, I'm gonna pay off current liabilities, or I'm gonna put it into intermediate assets and we're gonna see how that changes our setup. So the first example is that I put that $10,000 into current assets. So what that does is that, right, I just, I put that into uh, the bank account, I put that as cash. Uh, maybe I did some prepaid supplies with that additional $10,000. So that improves my working capital to $20,000. It improves my current ratio a little bit to 1.22. And you'll notice that it also um, adjusts my debt to asset ratio um, a little bit because we've got a, a, a change in our total assets. Now it, it doesn't make a very big blip on the total debt to asset ratio, um, but it does make a small one. So what if I take that $10,000 and I pay off current liabilities? So again, I go ahead and I make a $10,000 payment, pay off some of that debt. So like with the previous example, it increases our working capital to $20,000, but it improves our current ratio even more to 1.25. And again, makes a slight adjustment in the total debt to asset ratio. The last one is, what if I take that $10,000 and I buy a new pickup with it, okay? A new farm pickup or a new ranch pickup with it. So this time I'm not dealing with anything in the current portion of my balance sheet. So my working capital remains at 10,000. The current ratio remains at 1.1. And again, that $10,000 isn't a big enough um, number to really change my total debt to asset ratio. So overall, um, this is what happens. Um, we can see those differences and where we put that in, in the balance sheet. So when I'm working with a family or I'm doing it for ourselves, uh, trying to make a decision, um, what I like to do is just have an Excel file um, that calculates these ratios for me um, and looks at if I change each of these segments of the um, balance sheet, what it does to these ratios. If you're working with a lender, they may have um, an Excel file that they want you to work in, and it's really easy to make these adjustments. A lot of them will also uh, calculate these three ratios somewhere on your balance sheet. So if you're sitting here going, well, how do I improve, or what do I do to improve my balance sheet? And it's as simple as increasing assets and decreasing liabilities. So I've got to get those assets up 
and I need to work on reducing those liabilities. So um, a couple different ways that we can do this. Um, if you are going to sell an asset, you can sell it for more than what it is valued for on the balance sheet. Um, I'm gonna pull up another um, example. I'm gonna pull up an actual balance sheet. So here's an example balance sheet. And if you'll notice, um, this is from January 1st, 2020. On this balance sheet, they had um, valued their crop inventory, the corn that they had on hand at $3.20 per bushel. It's hard to remember that that was actually an accurate value back on January 1st of 2020. One way to improve this balance sheet would be to market this grain for more than $3.20 per bushel. That's one way to do it. The other thing is if I was gonna come down here and let's say sell something um, out of, of an intermediate asset category or even a long-term category would be to sell it for more than what it's valued for um, by, the, by the balance sheet. So that's one way to do it. Let's see if I can get that back up there. Um, another thing to, to do is to pay off debt. So um, those, those moments when you do have the opportunity, um, rather than maybe moving it just up and setting it in cash is just taking that opportunity to pay off that debt. The next one is refinancing. And I think refinancing kind of gets a bad rap, um, you know, or has a negative connotation with it. But I think refinancing is actually a tool that can be used um, when we're looking at the balance sheet. So uh, today it's probably not gonna be as popular as it was uh, for the last two years, but it was um, a good tool that, that farmers and ranchers were using. And there's two ways to refinance. The first way is to reduce that interest rate. And the second way is to extend the length of the loan. And what that does is it reduces the amount of principal payment that comes up to the top of the balance sheet um, or reduces that total interest expense. So um, in you know, 18, 19, and 20, what we were really seeing with farms and ranches is that interest rate was so low that they were refinancing uh, their farm land loans uh, to reduce that interest expense. We have seen some uh, farms and ranches um, extend the length of those loans to again, reduce that principal payment. You'll need to work with your banker uh, potentially on refinancing. When I look at refinancing, uh, typically it's that we have a challenge with our working capital and our current ratio in the top of the balance sheet, or um, that interest rate is just so attractive, <laughs> there's, we, should, we should just go ahead and lock in that lower rate. Another opportunity to improve your balance sheet is to delay a capital purchase. Um, I think some of this is happening right now. So if you've got you know, if this was the year to replace some tractors, maybe this is, you know, the cost of what they're running right now isn't feasible on your balance sheet. And you can hold off for a year or two and extend the life of, of that uh, piece of equipment or those cows and delay that capital purchase. Another thing you can do is to reduce personal withdrawals from the farm or the ranch business. Um, I think this is a low hanging fruit. A lot of times when I see um, a balance sheet that needs some help, um, of course we can do this um, if we need to do it, but usually there are bigger challenges than personal withdrawals from that business. The last one is selling off unprofitable or unnecessary assets or using assets more efficiently um, by something like custom farming. So again, going through the tree row, going through um, um, your equipment line and asking yourself, you know, is today the day that we really need that or can we sell that? Um, and again, improve that, that balance sheet by selling it off, paying off some debt or moving that up into, uh, into current assets. 
So I will say, if you would like to learn more um, about uh, all of your financial documents, not just your balance sheet, I would encourage you um, to watch for our Know Your Numbers, Know Your Options classes. Uh, we're going to be taking a break from those classes this summer, but we'll be restarting those in the fall. And what we do in those classes is we go through the balance sheet, the cash flow, and the income statement in depth like I did with you today. Um, and we talk about those challenges um, with record keeping and how to manage and design each of those documents. If you need some resources right now, um, I would encourage you to check out the book, Fearless Farm Finances. It is a textbook, um, but it has some good example um, examples of, of how to set up your record keeping system and again goes through each of those documents. So I do see um, there's some questions in the chat. If you have a question, you can go ahead and put that, uh, put that in the chat box. I'm going to switch over to my example balance sheet to answer one of the questions in the chat box right now is, um, so this time of year, would you count baby calves and hay still in the yard? Yes, if you're doing your balance sheet as of April 21st, then yes, you would put whatever um, that is. Now you'll see here I've got, depends on where they're gonna be at in, uh, in the balance sheet. So we're gonna again, are we gonna sell those calves off within the year or not? that will determine whether they'll go in current assets or intermediate assets. The other thing is I would value those baby calves on what they're worth today. Okay, so what are they worth today? Um, your banker will help you with some of that. Um, you know, on the corn at 320 up here, um, it's very common for a bank to include the same value for something like calves or corn or hay across all of their um, clients in their portfolio um, so that they can do those comparisons, right? Because again, if I have a value of 320 for corn and you have a value of $8 for corn, we're really not looking at the business, the, the differences in those two balance sheets could simply be due to the differences in those valuations. So work with your banker on what you should value things at. If you are just doing this for your own purposes, then I would value it at whatever, um, whatever the, the market is today for whatever those calves weigh or, or are today. Um, hay in the yard, same thing. Um, probably a little bit more difficult sometimes to value hay, but I look at whatever your, your nearest auction is or go off that banker's recommendation. Um, for the person who asked that question, if I didn't answer it completely, please let me know. So the other question is the difference in net worth and uh, earned net worth. Um, and that's kind of beyond where we're at today. Um, what I would really like to look at when I when I go down to the, the bottom of the sheet is just looking at what that total net worth is um, for your operation. Um, on, the, on the net worth question, I always find it interesting because it doesn't necessarily tell me a whole lot um, about the business. So um, if you want to relate it to personal finance, um, that's how we find everyday millionaires. If you're a Dave Ramsey fan is looking at what the net worth is. So you can have a million dollars worth of net worth, um, by having $2 million worth of assets and a million dollars worth of debt, or you can have a million dollars worth of net worth by having a million dollars worth of assets and no debt. So, uh, we really like to get into those ratios to, to dig in deeper, um, to that business and, and look at what's happening to that debt to asset. Um, I would also encourage you um, to look up that farm financial standards and you can see um, that they also have uh, additional um, um, measurements. And I, I know I'm not answering your complete question there um, between the difference uh, of those two, um, but go in and check out those farm financial standards and I'll include 
um, an explanation of each of their 21 um, calculations or measurements and how to calculate them for your farm or your ranch. So there are a couple of um, questions in the Q&A. Again, if you have one in the chat box, um, you can either put them in the chat box or in the Q&A. The question um, from one attendee is, uh, do you have a suggestion for a software package uh, to use for financial statements? Um, Yes and no. So I will say you will see um, most of the example um, items that we use um, come out of FinPack. Um, it's sometimes not the most user friendly software, but it is a farm financial software. Um, this software also calculates each of those 21 ratios for you. Um, but if I'm looking at a regular um, farmer ranch business, I like Excel. <laughs> frankly, and your bank is probably going to send you an Excel file. Um, let me scroll down here. One of the things that they'll do is they'll actually have you enter this information in what they call schedules. So they'll tell you, okay, enter all of your cash and checking. What's that worth? Enter all of your prepaid expenses and supplies. And so then uh, when you enter all of this information, it will then create the balance sheet for you and calculate those ratios for you. If you're looking for a financial software in general, um, I will tell you that no financial software is perfect. Um, if, you're, if you're in a specific software, you'll know that um, you, you wish you could change things about it or get it to work better. Um, I will say the Center for Ag Profitability does have uh, Record keeping courses, self paced videos for quick in and quick books. Those are two popular uh, softwares that we see farmers and ranchers using. But there's tons of different software out there, whether it's PC Mars, uh, Red Wing, Farm Logs, Ultra Farm, whatever it is, there's lots of different software companies that are out there right now. Um, but the, the most farms and ranches are either in quick in or quick books. Um, and it's up to you of, of what works better. If you ask your accountant, they're gonna recommend QuickBooks. QuickBooks is a uh, business software. It's a double entry accrual accounting software um, that's built for, for businesses. It's not built for farms and ranches. So there are some, some challenges that you'll have with it. QuickIn is a personal finance software. Again, that's not made for farms and ranches. Um, and basically it's set up like a check register. Um, neither one of those softwares does anything on the production side. So it can be difficult on both of those. So uh, thank you, Ryan. In the chat, he put in the link for the Quicken and QuickBooks trainings. Um, so another question is, there have been big changes in both prices and income and expenses expenses even since the first of the year, do we adjust our balance sheets um, or um, how do we handle that? And again, I like to see you do at least one balance sheet um, per year as of, as of January 1st. Um, and I don't like to change those values on that very much. Um, if I'm able to capture a higher um, price for something, that's just gravy, right? So again, going back to, you know, uh, I never, I didn't think this year we would see corn above $8 and your banker's probably not going to allow you to value that crop at $8 because the only way that you're going to actually um, benefit from that increase is if you actually sell at that level. So again, they're going to be more conservative in, um, in those um, valuations. On the expense side, um, you know, what we're, what we're listing here is the actual um, expense. So let's say you're trying to make some decisions and you, you would change maybe this investment um, in growing crops. 
but I'm probably not looking at my balance sheet often enough to really need to do that um, every few months. Now you might be in a position, uh, maybe you're a feed yard or something like that, that does submit a quarterly balance sheet, then yes, I would make those adjustments. But if you're a typical farmer ranch who submits a balance sheet once per year for loan renewal, I don't see a place where we're going to be adjusting them all the time. Because again, you're not really changing your business, you're just changing the values and, and we need to actually capture those values. All right, we have just a few more minutes left. If, uh, if you have any final questions, I am gonna pull up, since we've got a little bit of time, let me pull up um, one more thing for you. Again, if you have a question, um, feel free to, to drop it in the Q&A or into the chat while I, I pull up this other item. So um, included in the setup um, with the slides today, I'll also include, I call this the stoplight card. Um, this is each of the uh, calculations that you can uh, calculate and um, explains a little bit about each one of those um, and provides you with an area where you can calculate those for your own business. And then I'll also include, this is probably a better explanation of each of those ratios um, and gives you just a little bit more uh, information about them and um, how they work. All right, well, I'm not seeing um, any final questions in the chat or in the Q&A. So I would uh, like to thank you all for joining us today. Again, a recording of this webinar will be posted at cap.unl.edu. Join us next Thursday at noon for a webinar on the implications of avian influenza on the markets, poultry well-being, and biosecurity. Please click the link in the chat box here to take a brief survey and provide feedback on this webinar and inform us about upcoming webinars. Thanks again for joining us. So just uh, to uh, answer John's question, again, we will put those online on the CAP uh, website so that you can see the sheets that I just showed you, and I'll make sure that those are included in the packet for today's webinar.